would ask all now to join in unison with our call to God's word. Scripture cannot be set aside. What does scripture say? And in unison, our prayer for illumination. Lord, through your spirit, enable us to consider your word and to enact it in our lives to bring you glory and praise. Amen. I would ask that you get your pew Bibles now and turn to our next reading in 1 Timothy, where we're at in these weeks. We are still in chapter 2, beginning at verse 8, moving through chapter 3, verse 13. I'll begin the reading now. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not have, know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temp temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. We're stopping our screen sharing now, and I'm starting my video so that you'll be able to hear me preach. So let's take stock of where we are in First Timothy. First of all, we ended with Matthew, where Jesus began to speak about the building up of the church in Matthew 16 and 18. But in 1 Timothy, we have thus far heard of the vocational offices that Jesus laid out in Ephesians 4, 1. The office of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Last week, we heard of Paul's apostolic ministry and how he gives thanks in the midst of it in gratitude for what Jesus has done. The week prior, 
we heard of Timothy's office as a pastor over the church in Ephesus and how, how Paul as an apostle oversees him and writes these letters to him. Now today we're hearing of other key roles of, for the church. We've heard of apostle and pastor related to the last office of teacher is the one role of overseer or pres presbyter. You heard in the word that they must be able to, to teach. So this word presbyter or is often translated as ruling elder. The other role that we heard about in the passage is that of deacon. Stephen was one such deacon. If you'll remember last week, we had heard that Paul the apostle, before he was an apostle, had persecuted Stephen and other Christians. Now today is a very good time to hear this message from 1 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through 313, since the nominating committee has, under advice, studied this passage to discern candidates called for ruling elder and deacons who will come before the congregation for vote in a meeting following worship today and then be installed into their office at their specifically designated term. Now, you've heard in today's passage, Paul describe numerous attributes needed to be an overseer or a deacon. But when we hear of this passage, the focus often hones in on one seam of disqualification. And this is in verse 12 of chapter two. It says this, Paul writes, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over man. She must be quiet. So this verse is the one that's most discussed in this particular passage, and it's the main argument used against to protest women being in leadership in ministry, whether as a pastor or as an overseer or as a deacon. And I can't deny this particular verse is here. The elephant in the room needs to be named. Um, in fact, most of my life, I truly believe that I was disqualified and I never pursued it. I was told this and I readily accepted it. I even believed it on the day when a woman showed up in the pulpit. That day I decided that I wouldn't return to a church that so blatantly defied scripture. But all of you, or most of you at least, have heard the story of my conversion that came when I was eight years old and I received my first Bible. And that day I prayed earnestly to God that if it took the rest of my life, I wanted God through the Holy Spirit to help me understand every word in scripture. And the day when the woman showed up in the pulpit and I was reminded of this, I also had the impression that I was being challenged to allow scripture to interpret scripture, not scripture to be interpreted by what I heard about scripture from others. In addition um, to being told that being a woman was a disqualification, I also heard that Paul didn't think much of women, that he spoke badly of them, in fact. And so, um, that's what I was, I had been told. But I went back and I read all the scriptures pertaining to women. And um, even though I had accepted that Paul felt this way and women were disqualified. And I could continue to see how some people might believe the same. Here's some questions though to ask. First of all, if these interpretations by humans are true, then how can I be in the role of a pastor or how can any women be in the role of leadership, whether pastor, ruling elder, or deacon? So we might wanna say we have to adhere to that and all the other qualifications too. But here's another question. What if we say that's not what Paul said or we just simply disregard it without study? Does that mean then we should ignore this entire passage and even Paul and all of his letters? 
Should we ignore what Paul says? Well, we can't ignore what Paul says or these letters because we read in Paul's second letter, we'll hear this in later preaching. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. More on that when we come to the passage. But the point is, we cannot ignore what is said. We cannot push it aside. We cannot disregard it because it is scripture. And so what is useful in today's passage concerning this distinction between men and women in regards to overseers and deacons? First of all, it's important to know because the genre, the type of writing at hand is a personal letter, even though the parties of the letter know all the details, future readers like us, we're not privy to the details of the correspondence. We don't know everything that brought about the writing. But even with that, the first thing to notice, so go back to the beginning verses of this passage that I read. The first thing to note, and this is not uncommon, is when Paul makes mention of a specific gender, he usually puts the two genders side by side in instructions, pairing them. Perhaps because there are some issues in the church, in a particular church or the larger church, that pertain to a specific gender. So let's look first at, therefore, I want the men of everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. That's the comment made specifically to men by Paul. And so my male colleagues often tease me about verse 12 that says women should be quiet. And they'll remind me, when are you going to be quiet? Because of 2 Timothy verse 12. And I jokingly respond back, trust me, I will be quiet when I see your hands raised in holy prayer, like in Timothy verse eight. Now, apparently there was some issues of men raising their hands in anger, perhaps as fist, rather than holy hands raised in prayer. Later, I'll be giving some illustrations of this. And this idea of not raising hands in anger and disputing fits what Paul mentions in his qualifications for help that an elder is to be temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, not violent, but gentle, and not quarrelsome. So this regards Paul's information, direction, instructions for men. But now we come to verses 9 through 14, where Paul is speaking about women. First, he mentions that women are to be modest. That is, women shouldn't be dressing in a way to call attention to themselves in, in a time of worship or at any time. This is, this is for worship and the attention, as we said last week, is supposed to be on God, not on us. Now, the same thing is true for speech. If a woman is speaking in such a way that it draws the attention away from God into self, that is not good. So the main summation of these words is that a woman is not correct in acting in a way of calling attention to herself rather than to God. There's more to unpack in this language, but that's our first sum summation. Now, let's get into some specifics. If we look at verse um, 12, the verse in question, note that it does not say, I do not permit women that is in the plural, to teach or to assume authority over men. Do you see that? It says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. Why is that particular important? Well, it might be important because when we have trouble interpreting scripture, when it's not clear, we should look for alike passages. So if we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34 through 35, it says this, does speak in the plural, but it speaks about married women. 
women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is, a, it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. So for a woman to call attention to herself in the church and to speak when they could ask the questions of their husband at home. But even if in today's passage, what may, which may be different than the one in 1 Corinthians in certain ways, if Paul is not referring to just husband and wives, Paul obviously um, does not mean for women to be silent in all circumstances. The reason why we say this is because in his letters, Paul commends women who speak, those who teach and those who prophesy. This is one of the reasons why both men and women are called into roles of leadership, into offices at First Presbyterian Church to represent the balance of the congregation. Now, one strong biblical example of this used quite often, Paul commends Priscilla, referred to as his equal co-worker, included in the greeting at the end of Paul's second letter to Timothy. And Priscilla is the lead teacher, even above her husband, of Apollos, who is a man. So I know that this is a lot to unpack, but we're trying to name this. Further, if Paul is not just speaking of husband and wives, why is he bringing this up? The second possibility is that the reference about a woman and a man refers to not those who are married. If you'll remember, in Acts 15, in the Council of Jerusalem, sexual immorality was an issue in the Gentile cultures and therefore in the Gentile churches. So verses 11 and 12 might be even more likely speaking to this concern. Just as Paul asked the women to dress modestly, he might be talking about the situation where there are two people, a man and a woman, who are put together, there may be the temptation to sexual immorality, or at least the impression of such. Now, just to let you know, next week we'll be hearing more on this idea of purity, but I want you to know that as a pastor, I adhere to this strong advisement. I avoid being alone with, as a single woman, want a woman alone with a man. There have been a number of men in the congregation who have spoken to me, but they can vouch that I'll ask the secretary or perhaps a ruling elder to be present during those pastoral sessions. Some of you have been those elders present and some of you have been the men who have spoken with me. So I follow that advice of Paul. On that same vein, this idea of avoiding sexual immorality, we might want to take note of um, chapter 3, verses 2 and 12, the direct male overseers and deacons to be faithful to their wives. Now, some people interpret this because it's only mentioned faithful to the wives, that overseers can only be male, because there's no stipulation for a female overseer to be faithful or husband. But this more directly relates to the fact that although men might be married and can be in relationship with more than one woman in the culture of the time, a woman was never permitted to be married to more than one man. This idea of monogamy in a Christian marriage validates the original intention of marriage from Genesis that J Jesus reiterates in Matthew 19 verses 4 through 6. Haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made the male and female? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And that's the end of that, those verses. But because of men marrying or being in relationship with more than one woman, more than one wife, especially among the Gentile cultures at the time, of Jesus and Paul, this qualification is gender specific. Now, I know there's a lot to unpack, and I hope it became more clear, but to be even more clear, you might want to look at this book. 
Women in the Church, A Biblical Theology of Women in Ministry, written by Professor Stanley Grenz, who also is a theologian and a pastor. But now that we've named the elephant in the room concerning that gender-specific language, we really shouldn't be paying full attention to just that one disqualification. Our attention should be made to the many other qualifications that Paul describes for overseers and deacons. These are expressed in very clear language, and so therefore should not stir up any controversy in insisting upon them. However, be aware, fully aware, that controversy will certainly be stirred when churches and nominating committees do not adhere to these plain guidelines and when pastors, overseers, and deacons don't adhere to them. Consider this, if an overseer is known to be not above reproach, is unfaithful in marriage, is intemperate, uncontrolled, disrespectful, unhospitable, um, unable to teach, prone to drunkenness, violent, quarrelsome, a lover of money, a poor manager of one household, a new convert, or with a poor reputation is chosen to serve the church service. Both as a member of congregations and later as a pastor, I have unfortunately seen horrid results when Paul's guidelines and the scripture has not been adhered to. Now rest assured that none of the following examples are at First Presbyterian Church of Pataskala. My first instance of discovering this was when I was a lay person at the First Presbyterian Church I ever attended, and I was the overseer of the junior church program. So I was with the kids in the room, and there were other assistants that would come and help me. Well, one week, one of those assistant teachers showed up drunk, reeking of alcohol, and behaving terribly. Can you imagine how unsettling that was? While still trying to watch the children, I had to ask her to leave, try to find someone who would make sure she didn't drive drunk, and to quickly find a substitute to come into the room with me, all while trying to calm a classroom of rattled children. This is why leaders cannot be prone to drunkenness. Here's another example. In another instance, during my first week as a pastor in one church, my first week, I got a phone call the day after a nominating committee meeting that nearly came to fisticuffs during a heated argument. Here's examples at session meetings. At more than one church, this has happened. Rather than holy hands being raised in prayer, I have seen, not just heard, ruling elders slam their fist onto meeting tables and curse out loud. Unfortunately, I have many more examples to share, but I'm not going to at this point. Needless to say, I hope it's clear that Paul's instructions to Timothy and also to the pastor Titus in the following letters were needed in the early church and are still needed now. They cannot and should not be neglected. They should stand as guidelines to discern candidates for ruling elders and deacons. Let us be confident in accepting and committing to Paul's guidelines to discern overseers and deacons. To do otherwise neglect scripture. That said, please be very grateful for the thoughtful and prayerful consideration of 1 Timothy by your nominating committee. Please continue to pray for the candidates coming before the congregation for election those who are currently serving, those soon to serve, and those who will serve in the future, that they will not fall out of Paul's guidelines. And thanks be to God for Jesus's guidance to the church, still carried on by the apostles and the pastors, the teachers, rolling elders and overseers and followers of God's word today. Amen.
I'm stopping the video now and Linda will resume our screen sharing so that we can continue our worship and respond to the word that we have just heard by singing together, Here I Am, Lord. <laughs> 